All right, we're going to get started here with the afternoon. Uh, our next session, we're going to test technology. So our next speaker is with us virtually. You'll see her up in the uh, square, Dr. Fala, who's with uh, Duke University. And so I'll briefly introduce her and she'll um, start us off for the afternoon. Uh, Dr. Nadia Fala, she's a medical biochemical genetics fellow at Duke University. She's board certified in medical genetics and genomics and was previously an assistant professor of pediatric genetics and metabolism at West Virginia University. She's an advocate for rare diseases and a member of the West Virginia Advisory Council on Rare Diseases. Dr. Fala has collaborated with the WSS Foundation on several projects, including publications of a poster on the mosaic form of WSS, and also uh, working on a paper with us on our patient registry within courts. Um, I got to know Dr. Fala at a WSS family meetup that we did in Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, she is a true champion of our community and has been giving her all over the last few years. So I'm really excited for you all to get to know her and learn a little bit more about her research on WSS. And so with that, Dr. Fala, hopefully you can hear us and we'll be able to hear you once you unmute. You can take it away. Thank you, Christina, for the nice introduction. And uh, I'm very delighted to be here. I really wish that I was able to come and meet the families and the children. Uh, the relocation to a new place was um, make travel a little difficult. Um, I will be presenting today the mosaic form of WSS. I will start with an introduction and uh, Wiedemann Steiner syndrome has been first defined or uh, known as the um, hairy elbow syndrome. And the terminology in uh, hairy elbow is hypertrichosis cubiti, where these individuals presented with hairy elbow plus the other features that are not specific, including developmental delay, short stature, and distinctive facial features. Now, the syndrome was first described by Dr. Wiedemann and his group in 1989. And then several cases has been described afterward. In 2012, the group from UK had four patients with the clinical characteristics of WSS. They performed whole exome sequencing and they found the gene that causes the disease. Now I wanted to bring this timeline because it's interesting that in 1989, first case was described, 2012, we found the gene. When I first met uh, the family with Wiedemann Steiner uh, at West Virginia University, that was in 2019. And when I started learning about this disease, uh, there was about 50 cases described in the literature. Last week, when I was preparing this presentation, and reviewing the literature to make sure that everything is up to date. There are about 200 cases that are reported. And you can see how much increase in the number in the later years. And that is mostly because of the advanced genetic testing and also the Wiedemann Steiner syndrome um, foundation efforts in bringing up investigators uh, as well as patients together for us to learn more about the syndrome. Now, um, a lot of you may ask about the dysmorph dysmorphology and how these patients could be identified. Now, the dysmorphology is a little tricky. And the reason for that, because there are a lot of things that could contribute to the facial features, to the, uh, to the tall stature, to the short stature, including you know, parental variations, family variations, ethnic backgrounds. So we all know that WSS characterized by wide spaced eyes, maybe the breast nasal bridge, but these might be seen as well in ethnic, uh, in um, African-American, the depressed nasal bridge. 
it becomes that falls can also be seen in Asian population. Now, the, uh, the thick eyebrows could also be seen in Mediterranean regions. So the clinical uh, features or the facial features are very nonspecific. They may be typical and may, may suggest, but we usually rely on the genetic testing to confirm. I would say the hairy elbow could be pathognomic, which means that if you see it, it's very likely to be associated with WSS. And that is because sometimes we receive questions <coughs> Excuse me. Sometimes we receive questions about, um, is my child affected? Uh, whole exome sequencing revealed a variance of uncertain significance. Or I feel that, that my child has the same facial characteristics. So again, it, it can be very tricky just relying on the facial features because the word dysmorphology or the distinctive facial features could be related to other factors. And me as a geneticist, when a patient comes to see me, we usually compare the child to the family members to see if the child has a unique features that are not seen in the parents. And then we also look for more specific characteristics. Developmental delay and facial features by itself it may give you some suggestion, but it's not, cannot confirm a diagnosis. We always rely on the molecular. Um, so as I mentioned in the literature, there was about 200 cases that are described. In the Wiedemann Steiner Syndrome Foundation Registry, we found about 166 cases um, that have entered their data and provided an information about their uh, affected person in the family. Now, when we are collecting these numbers, we're not just interested in collecting numbers. More numbers means more information and means that more interventions might be happening in the future. And we're very excited about that. But when we look at this and we analyze the data, it gives us an information for us to act, to make a change, to make it better. So for example, um, this is the geographic distribution of individuals that has been reported with WSS at the registry. This is an international registry. So we're expecting that all the continent, all the countries could participate. However, by looking at this, we see that we have 110 patients or individuals who are from North America and NA is for North America. That means United States and Canada. So um, in the different other parts of the continent or the globe, there are fewer numbers of patients. Is that actually a true? That Wiedemann Steiner is more common in North America and that is not true because in the, the uh, WSS Foundation is located in the United States and it's more easier for them to communicate with the individuals who are affected in English, in the same language, probably in the same region. They have a lot of connection with providers, as well as, again, the, the language also plays an important role. Now, uh, if we also know that in the United States and Canada, there is more access to genetic testing. And um, for that, it, maybe it's important for their registry to start um, posting, bringing videos in a different languages, which may attract other places in the world to have patients to participate. Um, there's none from Middle East, so maybe Arabic. Uh, there's none from French, or what well, we have from French, but uh, maybe adding a French language, uh, a Spanish language to the registry or to the foundation could help us determine other patients from other places. And the importance of that is because other places may have a different genetic biomarkers or different genetic variations. And having a different genetic variation may lead to a different presentation and different presentation lead us to a different knowledge. So this all make it more um, knowledgeable for us to know the different types of the presentation, the mild, the severe, 
and um, different genotypes or different variations in the gene will help make more knowledge and, and thereafter is more interventions and treatment. Uh, the participant, the 166, uh, responded to a question about what symptoms or what systems that are involved with Wiedemann-Steiner. And as you can see here, that it's a multi-system. It's almost every system is affected. But most commonly, the facial features, the GI symptoms, the growth, the mouth, the neurological. These are considered to be the highest in these participants. And we don't wanna go into details about what these features are because I'm sure that there are other speakers that will talk to you more about the specific finding, the specific finding that the participant has reported in from the um, other different studies. But what I wanna mention here, and this also has been part of the registry that we have 112 participants who stated that the mutation was spontaneous. It means that it was not inherited. It happened out of the blue. And it's not here in the slide, but I wanna mention that the majority of patients, 80% stated that the provider or the doctor made the diagnosis based on a whole exome sequencing. And what does that mean? That means that the patient came to the doctor with developmental delay, distinctive facial features, concerning for possible genetic disorder, and the doctor did not know what was the clinical diagnosis. And what did the doctor order is something called whole exome, meaning testing all the genes to find the diagnosis, which this indicates that because of the rarity of the disease, not a lot of doctors will know that this is a Wiedemann-Steiner, as well as because of the wide spectrum of the presentation, it could be difficult. And previously, we only have 50 patients or less, now we have more. So we're hoping that by adding more knowledge, more doctors will be aware of the disease. And more doctors will not just order something called whole exome, testing everything just to find what's going on, but suspecting. We wanna have a suspected clinical diagnosis and then probably ordering just the gene that causes the WSS. And that way we can ensure that even those patients who does not have access to genetic testing may be able to get the diagnosis. And, um, and then again, more patient means more knowledge. Uh, we have in this, as I mentioned, that about 112 stated that the diagnosis was spontaneous. It means that was an inherited. We have 21 who said, we don't know. Maybe they have suspicion. Maybe the testing parents weren't done, but they answered, they don't know. We have four participant who stated that this was inherited. There was no specifics about where this was inherited from, mother, father, but they just mentioned that this was inherited from one of the, um, one of the parents. Now, there is a uh, Shepard uh, and Dr. Shepard and his group published a paper in 12, 2021 um, revealing or showing a family with a uh, WSS. As uh, you can see, we have the um, side view and the front view uh, of three siblings. So these are three siblings who are affected in the front and uh, the side views. Here is another um, family. And as you can see, father and a son to the left mother and a daughter and father and a daughter. And this is actually in Gene Review. And Gene Review is a great resource for you all. Um, I should have referenced it, but uh, you can just type in Gene Review WSS. It gives you all the details, all the summary about WSS, what has been done and what should be done. Um, so uh, again, I was very excited to see that as a summary, which can help providers as well as parents to be on top of their child's care, making sure that everything is done. 
in terms of management. In genetics, we don't treat, but we manage. So you don't want to miss anything that has been reported in the literature. So you can go over the gene review, just type in gene review WSS, you can find that. If you're seeing a primary care doctor that is not aware about WSS, you can even print that, provide it to them. Uh, we actually use it as a resource for us to, for management and for counseling. <laughs> now, the, the interest uh, or the question that I have here is the inheritance of WSS. And um, the question that we always encounter is that, what is the risk of having another child with WSS? So if a whole genomic, a whole exome sequencing is done, we identified a, a single, a child in the family, and then the couple may have, may be interested to have another children, may already have another child, and they will say, what is my risk of having another child with the same disorder? Is my, my future children, is my current children are affected? And that is the point of, or this is the main objective of this presentation, is to teach you and tell you exactly what, what we would expect. So in genetics, as a concept, we have something called de novo. And de novo is another way of saying a new change in the genes. So um, in many genetic disorders that are affected by one single gene abnormality, which we call autosomal dominant, one single gene abnormality, we may see the disease was inherited as sporadic. And sporadic means out of the blue. So this happened out of the blue. Mother, father are completely normal. They don't have anything in their body that is related to the genetic disorder. However, the mutation or the, the change in the gene might happen when uh, in their sperm or the egg. So the sperm or the egg spontaneously out of the blue, that sperm came with abnormal genetic change. And then when you conceive a child, that abnormal sperm or that abnormal egg comes to make the person and ends up having that genetic abnormality in that person. And this is what you see in the picture. Mother and father, they don't have anything. It just happened out of the blue in their germs. Now there is another way that the sperm is normal and the egg is normal. And then out of the blue, during the first few replications of the cell that led to a change in the gene. It's like you have a machine that makes a copies and copies of papers. And then out of the blue, there is one copy that had a one misspelling. Maybe one was a faded line. That's probably a deletion. But that is the way that when you have a replication in the germline or a replication of a person that is just an egg and a sperm communicated during that time of the communication, the a change happened. And then the child will be completely affected. There is a... Another way is that the egg and the sperm, as you can see here, I don't know if you see the arrow, but the egg and the sperm communicated, they made the zygote. The zygote is normal. But then during this replication, making more cells, this cell became abnormal. There was a change in the gene that caused this cell to be abnormal. Now these are going to replicate and replicate. And then that way, this became abnormal here. And so this person has two cell lines. It's not just one cell line. It's a two cell lines, one person, but two cell lines. One is the normal and one is the abnormal. It depends on how far it was, when, when the mosaicism or when that mutation happened. Most of the time, the mosaicism that happens in the person usually has no clinical significance. It means that it does not affect their, it doesn't cause a disease. Now, we usually see that in an abnormal pigmentation. So sometimes you see a person with hypo and hyperpigmentation, and then you wonder like, oh, why there is more dark places in his body? And then usually congenital. 
And then these are likely to be related to a mosaicism, that the color of the skin could be a little different. And they usually give an example of a cat. So if you look at the cat and you see that there is two different colors of that cat, then that is part of what we call mosaicism. There is, um, there is another, excuse me, to answer this. One second. So there is another way of looking at mosaicism. which is uh, basically, as I mentioned, that mosaicism most of the time does not have any clinical significance other than changing in the color, but sometimes it causes a cancer. So cancer, especially when the mosaicism doesn't happen early, as you can see here, but it may happen you know, in, in a specific organ. So cancer has been shown to be the cause of the cancer is an abnormal gene or abnormal chromosome that led to abnormal multiplications and the gene, uh, the body was not able to correct itself. Normally, if there is a mistake that happens in the gene, our body is supposed to get rid of that cell, eliminate it. But in that the process is decreased, then the mosaicism happened. And if it affects a specific organ, it may cause abnormal cell development and it may cause cancer. So this is a somatic mosaicism, which shows the difference of colors. Um, it could be segmental, it just in one place, it could be multiple, depending on when the mosaicism happened. Now, I wanna take a look at this figure here, and this could either come from mother or father. So the coloring here could be either way. This is an example of a somatic mosaicism, where the father here may have the abnormal Wiedemann-Steiner cell, um, Wiedemann-Steiner syndrome in his body, localized to a certain areas. It's not affecting him, but it could be somewhere there in the body. Now, if it is affecting the body, but does not affect the germline, then it may go unnoticed because you won't have a children who are completely affected and you are okay, you don't have any medical problems, probably mild delays, probably mild not doing well in math, not doing well in reading, I couldn't pass high school, very mild symptoms. Now, if this, Somatic mosaicism or this abnormality affected the germline. When you conceive a child, the child could be affected. And then you go back and um, you ask your parents about you when you were a child, or when you were a kid. And then um, there's not a major issues, but mild symptoms similar to the child. Um, but not very severe or not very prominent or significant. May go unnoticed if you don't have a child who is affected. The child will be completely abnormal uh, or not completely abnormal, but he will have the full phenotype. His body will be all full with that genetic abnormality. Now, um, there is another way of mosaicism. I remember that in the previous slide, it could affect the body or it could affect, it could affect the body and the germline. Here, we're going to talk about germline mosaicism, where the abnormality just affects the germline. And here in this picture, it affects the egg of the mother, <coughs> but not her body. So she doesn't have, she doesn't, she's asymptomatic. She doesn't have any symptoms, but in her germline, she has the mutation, not just one sporadic mutation. She has multiple mutations because these germlines multiplicate and multiplicate and multiplicate over time. And when they multiplicate, there will be a lot of room for mistakes. It's different from the whole body. 
germ lines, they make a, a lot of, of cells, maybe hundreds of thousands during life for, for sperms and less than that for eggs. And because of this multiplication over and over, there is a room for a mistake. Remember that if you don't work, you don't, you don't make mistakes. But if you work a lot, then the room for mistake will be there. This is the same thing here. If the sperm and the eggs are the main organs or the main cells in our bodies that replicates the most, then the mistake that may happen in the DNA is there. And that is what germline mosaicism. So it may not be in your body, but it may be in your germs. And the way that this was found is that a family comes with a child, we did the genetic testing, and they're affected with, for example, Wiedemann Steiner. We test the parents' blood, but they don't have the disease and they will be okay. This is sporadic, most likely sporadic. This is not gonna happen again in future children and this and that, and then they think, okay, this probably happened out of the blue, most likely, which is, yeah, that's true. It's most likely happened out of the blue, but there is also a possibility that in your blood, in your body, you don't have it, but in your germs, in the egg and the sperm, you may have that mutation. And in that case, the risk for having another child with the same disease is going to be higher than the general population. It's less than 50%. Usually. But it is higher than the general population. And we usually see genetic disorders, even with the parents that are not affected, that multiple siblings will have the disease. And then in, in this, this also, this is very important during counseling because now there is availability of in vitro fertilization, there is the availability of technology to determine if the fetus or the newborn will have the disorder or not right before even conception or during early time in pregnancy. This is another way, uh, another picture, just to give you a, an overview about with and without, with or without germline. So the germlines, when it comes to mosaicism, it's so important for the counseling and is so important for future children. If you look at the left side, this person here has abnormal cells. Let's consider this as a Wiedemann Steiner cell. He is not symptomatic, it's not affecting his brain, it's not affecting his organs, very mild affecting parts of his body. But then his germs are completely normal. So when he conceives a children, they all going to be normal. This person will not come to the clinic. We're not going to see him because he is asymptomatic. There's no one know that he has these abnormal cells. This person here to the right, he has an abnormal cells that are, let's say, with the Steiner, but his germs by chance also get affected. So he has normal sperms and then one sperm that is abnormal. <coughs> There could be more than one that's more than one that is abnormal. Let's say a hundred and then five that are abnormal. And when this person conceive a children, they well, some of them will be normal, and then one will be having the disease. And we take a blood from this person, and he say, Oh, is this inherited? We take a blood from this person here, from this hand, and his test comes back negative. I will say, oh, there, there's no, um, there's no, you don't have the disease. So this is probably a de novo. Usually if you meet a genetic counselor, they will say, we cannot rule out germline mosaicism. Actually, we cannot rule out germline mosaicism and also somatic mosaicism. Because if it affects a small number of cells, then you may end up being asymptomatic and have no issues. Now, um, why, how this came to my attention and why this is, um, this is what I'm presenting today. So when I was in West Virginia practicing um, genetics, I met a family who have two siblings who are affected with Wiedemann-Steiner syndrome. And they both have a KMT2A gene mutation. They both have the same mutation. 
and both parents were negative. Now, the thing is, if you think about this backward, let's say that um, the six-year-old comes to my clinic and concerning for a developmental delay syndromic features, and the, baby, the child has a, her a hairy elbow syndrome. And then we test the child and he has the KMT2A and he was identified through whole genome, whole exome sequencing, same way. Now, if we think about this backward, if the mother was not pregnant or she has, this is her only child. And if she asks, am I going to have another child with Wiedemann Steiner? The answer would be at that time, very likely not because you and the father, you both don't have the disease because we tested you and you both don't have it. So this is likely something that happened out of the blue during the conception, egg and the sperm communicated during that, during that replication, a change in the DNA caused the Wiedemann Steiner. Now, a surprise happens and the two-year-old sister who, have the, um, who, who also had developmental delay she did not have the classic clinical feature. She did not have the hairy elbow. She was doing well compared to her brother uh, at the time of the presentation. Um, and then we test her and she is positive for the same exact mutation that her brother has. Then the lab said, all right, this is probably our mistake. We need to take another look to the parents. So they looked at the uh, parents, and this was again a trio. A trio means that whole exome sequencing done for the child and the two parents. And this is what they found in the children. But then given that the sister have the same exact mutation, the lab was like, there was something wrong going on. Let's go back and review. And um, with they, when they reviewed, they found that the father has a mosaic form of Wiedemann Steiner. And the mosaic form means that part of his body were tested and they found to have the 4%. That's a very low level of mosaicism. And by the way, if, if anyone does genetic testing, it won't tell you it's, it's a special test. It's not, it can't be discovered for anyone who get tested. Usually when they test, they test one cell or um, two to three cells for the mutation. But when you do the mosaic study, you look for multiple, you look for a different technique. So it has to be requested. And here it was done because the lab was interested or was aware that there was something wrong or something that could be discovered um, in this in this finding where you have two children who were affected and then going back again, asking a family history, the father himself reported that, oh, I was having difficulties in school. I maybe um, did not pass easily math, reading, things like that. Things that you might ignore and you might think that they're part of normal people that are not interested in school. But in reality, these uh, people or individuals may have a mosaic form that causing them to have that learning issues, which is part of the spectrum of the disorder. Now, you, might, you, you may wanna say 4%, is that an actual number? Meaning that is that person or a person with a 4% mosaicism, is that, what is the mosaic level? The answer is no. That is only from the sample that we take, we took from him, that showed the 4%. Maybe if I take another sample, it shows 10%. Maybe if I take a third sample, it's a 0%. A fifth sample, maybe 70%. So it depends on where, and you know, it depends from sample so to sample, the percentage may change. They usually say, if you want a real number, or approximately near real number, you take a skin biopsy, you come to the skin and you take a biopsy or a muscle biopsy. Why? Because the blood replicates and replicates. It doesn't give you a, a, a nice answer. You need to have an established tissue. 
even an established issue. The only way that you do that is you take that person and you take a sample from him from everywhere. And then you count the mosaicism. But that's actually not a, um, theoretically, that's a theoretically, but you can determine how much a person is mosaic. And there are, interestingly, a lot of investigators and a geneticist believe that every human has a mosaicism in their body. And we all have different abnormal cells, but they are very small in number that they may go unnoticed. Unless we have a children, if, unless if it affects our germline, then we'll be able to determine them. But again, this is just a theory because our body replicates their cells, our body cells replicates and makes cells every day. And the room for a mistake is, is always there. So we always have an abnormal cell. Normally our body's supposed to clean it up to get rid of abnormal cells. And that's part of cancer. However, when the body fails to remove that, it continues to stay. If it has a bad impact on you, it may cause cancer. It may have <coughs> a syndromic features. It may go unnoticed. So it depends on what happened and what type of mutation. And our DNA is, is a huge library that has too many interesting things. And you can see here uh, that this is a difference between the uh, full and the milder form or the 4% mosaic. We see a features that are common in between. And then there are some features that are not there. And, um, and as you can see here, um, this is a same exact mutation from child to the uh, from the brother to the daughter and uh to the father the son to the daughter to the father same exact mutation different percentages now it is very important that we report the mosaic cases and the most important part is not the clinical features because we know that there is a spectrum the most important thing is to know this I don't know if you see my arrow, but the, the code, the CV1569X, is this the one that causes the mosaicism? Is this the one that is most likely to cause a mosaicism? A mosaicism to cause a full WSS. So uh, we know that if you think about the mosaicism or an abnormal mutation that happens through printers, so you have printers that gives you copies and copies. And then because it gives you 2,000 copies, there is a chance that one page, there will be a place where that will be uh, deleted or maybe a kind of messed up. So um, there could be some words are more liable for having that abnormality compared to others. So that is important. It's important to know which letter in that page that is most likely to be affected with the printer mistake. And this is, again, this is about the mosaicism in the WSS and cells. When the cells replicate in the germline, do we have a specific mutations that may affect the gene and causes this abnormality in the germline that they may lead to a full WSS? And having that information is very valuable <clears throat> and we're hoping to get it done um, and to have shed more light on the molecular aspects of WSS. So um, now with the more cases that are identified with the help of the WSS Foundation, um, you know, sharing awareness is a huge and important task for all of us to do between providers, between individuals, between people, and to help us determine the cases that are um, having the, the WSS, learning from them. And I am very sure that we are missing a huge number of the milder cases 
because the milder cases may not come to the clinic or maybe they come to the clinic, but the doctors and the providers may not order genetic testing for them. So we need to have this, a, um, we need to share awareness between both doctors, patients, and future healthcare generations, medical school students, and um, nursing students, and all of these, because these are going to be the future of healthcare that they will be able to determine rare diseases. Now, uh, the event that happens that causing the mosaicism, it has to be described, has to be uh, determined, and um, to say why this is happening and which variations that are mostly or likely to be affected. That will shed light in an important aspect. There is also a theory that, again, difficult to prove, but there could be the mosaicism happens before or after, meaning that you have a, a person who has a full mosaic, uh, who has a full WSS, but then during childhood or during neonatal period, the body is selecting or trying to get rid of abnormal cells and keeping the normal cells. So it's like the body is choosing the normal cells over the abnormal cells that lead us to a milder form of mosaic WSS versus that the replication happens in a different direction. And that is what is called a reverse event, which is the partial correction of a germline mutation has been reported. Um, so we know that the, double, uh, the KMT2A the postsomatic mutation can happen in the blood and it may cause cancer. So uh, and it's related to mostly leukemia and blood disorders. We know that the postsomatic or the, the changes in that gene could happen, not just to cause the WSS or the mosaic form of WSS, but it may also cause cancer. And for that reason, determining and defining the mosaic form of this gene is important from too many aspects. It may also let us know what genes that are at uh, or what variation that may have the highest increased risk for cancer, and it may help with prevention and as well as surveillance. Um, and I think that it's important to, to have that in mind if parents are, or if the couples are planning a future children. So uh, this will help them determine if they wanted to go ahead with conceiving a child without intervention, or if they wanted to do something else to make sure that they have another child with no syndrome. But these are all optional. And most of the couples <coughs> will need a an extensive counseling before making decisions. Even if you decide to go ahead with no any intervention, but it's important for you to have a good understanding. <coughs> all right. I think that's all. Um, that's all what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, these are the references. And I would like to acknowledge the patients and the families and the families who participated in, our, in the registry. And please continue to make efforts because your participation helps us tremendously. It's not just a number. It's not just an information. It's more knowledge for us. And it's more bringing more investigators who will be interested to do more for Widem and Steiner. Uh, society. This is my contact information. <coughs> and thank you so much.